Is there anything more frustrating than doing this thousand piece puzzle and finding that by the time you get to the end, there's a piece missing? Isn't that annoying? Now, I, I, don't, I haven't done a lot of puzzles in recent years, but I'm led to believe that a great place to go and buy puzzles is the thrift store, because you can get a puzzle for probably next to nothing compared with what you pay for it in the store, but there's not necessarily a promise that it's all going to be there. Sense of frustration, almost there, just this little wee bit missing. This can work with other things too, right? So let's say you're putting together a new barbecue because they never come assembled, right? Unless you pay for it. Supper might be late if you're missing some pieces. Or maybe you're building some Ikea furniture. If you're missing pieces from there, you might be sitting on the floor. Any of these scenarios can leave us wound up. The missing piece leaves us with missing piece. Homonyms are great, aren't they? The missing P-I-E-C-E -E leaves us missing P-E-A-C-E. -E. I'm going to spend two weeks talking about the missing piece and uh, how we can remedy that problem. We can be missing it in a great variety of ways, especially in this age of unprecedented busyness, right? We, we've come to a stage in society where it's actually a badge of honor to be busy. You say to somebody, how are you? That person's going to say, oh, I'm great. I'm real busy. That isn't necessarily good. I mean, supervisors are expecting more out of us in terms of time and production. Kids are involved in this long litany of extracurricular activities in which they may be ferried here and there and everywhere at all hours of the day or night. Household chores still have to be done. The list goes on and on and on. And then we have social media, which, you know, time we used to spend with loved ones now is often spent looking at a Pop-Tart like thing with a screen that has more power in it that we can put in our pocket than a computer 30 years ago would have taken up a whole room to be able to do. And this keeps us connected to work and to others in ways we never thought possible. Useless fact. The Earth revolves around the sun at 30 kilometers a second. Who knew? But you know what? There are times in human society where we feel like we're in competition with the Earth for speed, trying to keep up. I had a day a couple of weeks ago where the night before I was just dreading it because I looked at the calendar and I thought, I have totally overbooked myself today. And poor Paul, he was the first one I had to meet with, and he, he got the brunt of the blow, poor brother, I still am sorry for that. But, you know, you, I, I put so much into the day, it wasn't fair to the people with whom I was meeting, all, all of those meetings were good and necessary and important, and it wasn't fair to my wife, uh, who expected me to act human when I finally got home, when really all I wanted to do was curl up in a ball and Hibernate. That day, unlike most, I felt like I was missing peace. For some, though, if they're honest, that describes every day. We fill our calendars and overcommit ourselves to the point where we don't leave much margin for rest or for worship or for peace or for quiet. A lot of people are missing peace. And in this short series, we're going to talk about two kinds of peace. We're going to talk about today about peace with God. And next week, we're going to talk about peace with our family. Because chances are, if we're going to have something rumble up from beneath the surface in our lives and cause a lack of peace, it's probably going to have something to do with the people we love. So we're going to save that one for next week. That'll be an encouragement for you to come again. But a lot of people are missing peace. Most of us... If we are honest with ourselves, 
we'll admit that it's difficult to have a conversation with a person whom we know is dying. The dynamic of the conversation can vary in so many ways, but so often what happens is, depending on the, the faith of the person who's visiting and the faith of the person being visited, sometimes what will happen is a conversation will come up in which this question will arise. Have you made peace with God? And it's a good question. A lot of people don't really know what that means. Usually they're asking if the person has made up with his or her maker, assuming that the dying person has been estranged from God over the course of his life. But to be sure, busyness has caused a lot of people to be estranged from God. Busyness is a tool. Don't miss this. Busyness is a tool that Satan uses to keep us from God. Because if we're honest with ourselves, what often happens when we're so busy, the first thing to get chopped off the list? Coming to church. And it happens to us all at times, but it doesn't need to be that way. Sadly, the, the coming to church habit is, is an easy one to break. So many habits are hard to break. This one seems to be easy because, of course, we have some help from down below. When we fall away from worship and community, it becomes easy to become estranged from God. And that peace that we may have had in our relationship with God fades away, often being replaced with something that just adds to the frenetic pace of life. There's a few things we can know about peace with God, and I've put them in your notes this morning. Uh, I, for those of you who are guests here today, what I tend to do uh, in the bulletin is I put some blanks in once in a while. It helps to keep you awake in case you're inclined not to be awake. And uh, they're not difficult to fill in, but I'll give you a hand with them anyway. So here's the first one. When we do not follow Jesus, whether we know it or not, we are at war with God. We are at war with God. In the world of spiritual conflict, God is not like Switzerland. There is no neutrality. There is no neutrality. God is on one side, and if we do not follow Jesus, we are on the other side. That sounds harsh, but in fact, the Bible actually corroborates this when it says this. This is uh, some words from the Apostle Paul, who was sort of Jesus' right-hand man after he rose from the dead, helping non-Jewish people come to know Jesus in, in the Gentile world. And in one of his letters to a church in Ephesus, which is like now in Turkey, he says this in Ephesians 2, 1 to 3. 1 to 3. Once you were dead because of your disobedience and your many sins, you used to live in sin just like the rest of the world, obeying the devil, the commander of the powers of the unseen world. He is the spirit at work in the hearts of those who refuse to obey God. All of us used to live that way, following the passionate desires and inclinations of our sinful nature. By our very nature, we were subject to God's anger, just like everyone else. So if we're not in step with the Lord, then we're at war with him. But the great news is that there's a simple solution to this. And that's the second point. To have peace with God, we accept his peace offering, Jesus used to be common in territorial conflicts that when a war was over, there would be a peace offering shared between parties. Nowadays, that seems to be reserved for marital conflicts, much to the delight and relief of florists everywhere. But Jesus is God's peace offering toward us. We make the conflict by living in willful disobedience, by living in sin, but God provides the solution. When Jesus died on the cross, he created the opportunity for us to be back in right relationship with God. Because God's standard, God is perfect, just by definition, and his, his standard is perfection. But we who live after the fall of Adam and Eve, you know, oh, there's that nice tree, not supposed to eat of that tree, pick the fruit, eat off that tree, knowledge of good and evil, all that stuff from early chapters of Genesis. That changed humanity forever, and we now have a predisposition towards sin. God's standard is perfection. Our standard is sin. What do we do? Jesus is the remedy. God has taken matters into his own hands, because the Bible says that God took him, 
who had no sin to be sin for us so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. So the idea there is that because we can't measure up, God sent his son who does measure up. Jesus lived a perfect human life because he's fully God and fully human. And so when we trust in him for our salvation and not try to do it ourselves through our own good deeds, trust in Jesus, that is what brings us peace with God. Jesus stood in our place. That The sin that, that separates us from God creates this chasm, right? So God's over here, we're over here, chasm of sin. And the only thing that bridges that gap is the cross of Jesus Christ, who died and rose again for us. When we say yes to Jesus by faith, placing our hand in God's already extended hand of grace and mercy toward us, we have peace with God. Paul wrote to another church, a church in Rome, and he said this, Therefore, since we have been made right in God's sight by faith, we have peace with God because of what Jesus Christ our Lord has done for us. That's Romans 5.1. What that's saying is this. We... This is the third point. We can't earn peace with God. It's a gift. It's a gift. <laughs> if you decide by God's grace to trust Jesus and live in relationship with him today, I guarantee that you will walk out of here a different person. Don't misunderstand. Your problems will not go away. But you will have a different perspective on your problems than you did when you got here. Jesus gives us a whole new frame of reference with which to look at life. <coughs> Peace with God is actually a state of being. When I have peace with God, I'm in right relationship with God. I have standing with God because of Jesus. But there's a side benefit beyond all the glories of heaven when we have peace with God. And this is the last point. When we have peace with God, we also have the peace of God. The peace of God. I think that's actually sought by more people than peace with God, to tell you the truth. Besides what we've already discussed, there's another reason for this, and that is the intangible nature of the peace of God. I want to illustrate this by reading from another one of the Apostle Paul's letters. This is Philippians, the letter, letter to the church in Philippi in the first century. Chapter 4, verses 4 to 9. This is a great section. It starts out, Paul says, Always be full of joy in the Lord. I say it again. Rejoice. I want to stop right there for a second because this is interesting. This is a double emphasis, right? Always be full of joy in the Lord. Again, I say, rejoice. Why does he do that? Because I think what he's saying is that if he only said it once, it would invite the question, how can we rejoice in view of our circumstances? But it doesn't matter whether we're experiencing attacks from people of false belief or personality clashes or persecution from the world or the threat of imminent death, all of which Paul faced as he was writing this. Christians are to maintain a spirit of joy in the Lord. You can be sorrowful, of course, but count as your greatest joy the will of God and no inner peace. Let's carry on. Let everyone see that you are considerate, that you're gentle and kind, considerate in all you do. Let everyone see this, it says. Everyone, being your family, your friends, your co-workers, your church friends, Remember, he says, the Lord is coming soon. Why does Paul say the Lord is coming soon? Why does that matter? Because he wants us to look at life in light of eternity. Look at life in light of eternity. Don't worry about anything. Instead, pray about everything. Tell God what you need and thank him for all he has done. Then you will experience God's peace, which exceeds anything we can understand. His peace will guard your hearts and minds as you live in Christ Jesus. You want God's peace? You want the missing peace? Follow what we're just reading here, and that's going to make the difference. And now, dear brothers and sisters, one final thing, he says. 
Fix your thoughts on what is true and honorable and right and pure and lovely and admirable. There's a number of different ways of reading that. You could say uh, what is reliable, noble, just, morally pure. And those words lovely and admirable mean pleasing and praiseworthy. And it's the only place in the whole New Testament those words are found. So Paul must have been really intentional about his use of those terms. Think about things that are excellent and worthy of praise. In other words, center your mind on these things and live as a follower of Jesus. Keep putting into practice all you learned and received from me, everything you heard from me and saw me doing. Because doctrine was learned by living it out before the New Testament was written down. So, to you who are followers of Jesus here this morning, you need to realize that you have a responsibility to your friends to live out your walk with Jesus. So, let other people imitate you. And then, he says, the God of peace will be with you. Did you see the movement in those last two verses? He says, fix your thoughts. Start by thinking, and then keep putting into practice. Then act. Think first, then act. This is not common in contemporary society, is it? Thinking before we act? Who to thunk it? I want you to consider this passage in another light, though. The man who wrote these letters, this particular one, Philippians, uh, in, in, in particular, he was in prison when he wrote this. He was chained up, perhaps let go. Well, he may not even have been let go to write because in most cases he had someone who, to whom he dictated it. So somebody would visit him and he could have it dictated. But here he is sitting in a barren Roman prison cell saying, Rejoice in the Lord always. Impressive, isn't it? He could talk about the peace of God that goes beyond understanding because even in those adverse circumstances, he had the peace of God. He could look at life in a different way because of what Jesus has done for us on the cross. There's always people trying to get inner peace, right? Achieve inner peace. Some will try yoga. Some will try jogging. But inner peace cannot be achieved. Besides, you ever seen anybody smile when they're jogging? If you ever see me jogging, all you have to do is be a little bit faster because I'm being chased by a bear. <laughs> what Paul says in verse 7 is that this peace we get from God that exceeds anything we can understand accomplishes far more than any human forethought or plan might devise. We can't manufacture God's peace. It is a gift. It is grace. Doesn't matter how we contort our body, what position we sit in, how many ways we breathe, the peace of God is a gift from God. It's what, we, what happens when we wave the white flag in the war against God. And this peace accomplishes something very tangible for us. The end of verse 7 says, His peace will guard your hearts and minds as you live in Christ Jesus. That's exciting. That that peace isn't just a... But it's actually guarding your heart. Guarding your mind. There's so much in contemporary society that seeks to bombard our minds, bombard our hearts with that which is not of God. And if we have the peace of God that passes all understanding, it guards our hearts and guards our minds in Christ Jesus. That's amazing. The psalmist says in Psalm 3, 3, But you, O Lord, are a shield about me. You are my glory, the one who holds my head high. It's, you know, the Lord is a shield about us. And as Ed read for us in Psalm 121, The Lord himself watches over you. The Lord stands beside you as your protective shade. Isn't it great when you're in the sun on a really hot day, not like today, but like we had earlier in the week, uh, 
to be able to have a place where you can stand in the shade and it makes all the difference in the world. The Lord, the Bible says, the Lord is your shade at your right hand. The sun will not strike you by day nor the moon by night. God's peace is like a sentry to guard the believer's heart and the believer's thoughts from all anxiety and despair. So how do we receive that marvelous gift? Verse 8 gives us a good idea. It says, fix your thoughts on what is true and honorable and right and pure and lovely and admirable. Think about things that are excellent and worthy of praise. Put your faith to work by thinking well. A.W. Tozer was a great preacher of the 20th century, and he said this, what goes into a mind comes out in a life. Even psychologists have proven that that's true because of the various sorts of elasticity that exist within the brain, that what we put in affects who we are. Read good Christian literature, by the way. We have a terrific church library. I'd say, in all honesty, it's the best church library I've ever seen in terms of the quality of the material in it. You can borrow from it any time. It's just on the other side of the gym. You can sneak in there before you go down for lunch, or if you want to know where it is, say, talk to me at lunch. I'll bring you up to the library. It's a great spot to borrow stuff. And then verse 9 adds to this idea. We're just about done here. Keep putting into practice all you learned and received from me, and then the God of peace will be with you. So Paul has modeled for the Philippians how they should live in Christ as he expects them to imitate him. And we too can imitate Paul, we can imitate Jesus, and our friends can imitate us as we live in Christ. Don't forget, friends, that you have well over 100 hours a week to live your faith before others and to tell them about the peace that God has given you. So making peace with God brings both blessing and responsibility. God's peace, like anything else, is not something to be hoarded, but to be shared. So, for you, the question is, have you made peace with God? Better to consider that question now than to wait until you're on your deathbed, because peace with God is not just about pie in the sky when you die, right? You know, some people say, oh, I made my peace with God, and I can die a happy man. Well, the fact is, if you make peace with God now, you can live a happy person, too. Because you can influence the world. It's an uphill battle, man. But you can influence the world to make it more like the kingdom that God intends to bring to this place. I've said it before, I'll say it again. All the best philanthropic effort in the world, all the ways in which effective change for positive good has been made, has been done by people who have peace with God, who are passionate to share God's peace with others. Democracy, as we understand it, Christian. Emancipation of slaves, Christian. The Red Cross, Christian. Habitat for Humanity, Christian. Victory House, Christian. See, people who have the peace of God in their hearts are the ones who are making the biggest impact on the needs of the world. So today I want us to make this practical. Oftentimes on the connection card, Kim very kindly told you that you can just tear your connection card off, which you can do. Uh, but there's some steps on there that uh, I'm encouraging you to take. Normally I give you some steps. But today I want you to come up with those steps. I want you to think about what you need to do in response to what you've heard this morning. Maybe you can do something practical that will benefit another person. You could write that in there. Or maybe you haven't experienced the peace of God yourself. If you don't believe you have peace with God, or if you're not sure if you've got that which passes all understanding, then you need to place your trust in Jesus. Because eternity, eternity is in the balance. And God wants you on his side. If that's you, then 
in these quiet moments we're going to take here this morning, I want you to pray. I want you to turn away from that which keeps you from God, all the sin that keeps you at war with him. Accept God's peace offering of Jesus so you can experience peace with God and the peace of God. We're just going to take a few minutes in quiet. I've left the connection card blank on purpose. You can fill in how you believe God is inviting you to respond today. Perhaps if you want peace with God, you can check that off so I can follow up with you. And the other options are there as well. So let's just take a couple of moments in quiet and contemplate this before we pray. God of second chances, of third and fourth and fifth chances, we thank you that you have given us the possibility of peace with you in Jesus Christ, your Son, who died on the cross to save us from sin and who rose from the dead to bring us everlasting life. As we welcome the peace you bring, Help us to share it with others in ways that will make a difference in this world that so desperately needs your peace. We pray for peace to reign in the hearts of people here today and in places all around the world, that as Jesus reigns in more hearts, the world will daily come closer to resembling what you envision it can be. We ask this in the strong name of Jesus Christ. Amen. We're going to close worship before we go down for lunch by singing the river, and I invite you to stand.